wanted to just do a couple housekeeping items. Uh, we'll be going for about 40 minutes, including the presentation and a live demo. And then we'll have some time for some questions and answers at the end of that. Um, if you do have questions as we go along, make sure to put them in the questions box in Bright Talk here, and I will address them at the end. The recording will be made available shortly after the presentation, and then it'll be on our YouTube channel after that. So without further ado, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Darren Madams. I'm a solutions architect. I've been with uh, Spectra Cloud since January of this year. Previously, I was at Weaveworks, uh, the inventors of the term GitOps um, and the makers of Flex CD and Flagger. So I'm very familiar with uh, those progressive delivery type tools. Uh, prior to that, I worked for uh, a few of the legacy software and hardware vendors, Hitachi, Dell EMC, um, and Veritas. So I came from a strong business continuity um, background. So I, I, I will hopefully be able to share some of those lessons I've learned there with you. Prior to that, I was on the customer side working for the largest network of hospitals in Northern California, Sutter Health. Um, I, I did many roles there, um, did a lot of business continuity there. Um, a, a very old hospital network with some very impressive IT technology, but far from leading edge. Um, and then on a personal note, uh, I'm a licensed glider pilot. So that's what I do on the weekends. Uh, when I get too stressed out with Kubernetes, I, I go up in the sky and I circle around for hours at end trying to find some peace. So that's a little about me. Um, let's go over the agenda, what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to touch briefly on, on some of the pain points of upgrading Kubernetes. Um, I realize you're all here because you're probably struggling with it, so we'll go over some of those reasons. We'll talk a little about Kubernetes versioning. Um, the Kubernetes maintainers do a great job of um, planning and implementing Kubernetes releases. So we'll talk about how that works. We'll cover a few upgrade strategies, um, some postures of how you might want to run your organization. And then the meat of the presentation will be some best practices uh, that you can put into place for helping with your Kubernetes system. And then at the end, I'm actually going to do two upgrades to, to um, two of my Kubernetes clusters, one in staging and one in production. So let's pray to the demo gods and hope that that works out for us. So Kubernetes is tough and painful, right? Um, that's why you're here. Uh, I, I feel your pain. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with some of these stories. Um, the Reddit Pi Day outage is a big one. I'm, I'm addicted to Reddit, and like I'm sure most of you are. Um, but if you remember back uh, Pi Day, they had a major outage all day, and they had you know their millions of viewers were just not able to access the site. So that's millions of lost ad impressions. So they lost a ton of revenue that day, um, and and a ton of confidence from their users. They wrote a great uh, blog post detailing the reasons that they had the failure, and it was related to Kubernetes. So I, I recommend you check that out. Um, and then also Skyscanner had, had a big upgrade, and they published a great article, too, about the impacts of an upgrade change that, that they did. And again, they lost revenue there. Their, their primary source of revenue is through bookings of, of airline flights. So these are real world examples of where an upgrade is not only painful, it's also costly. And then this thread right here, how do you handle continuous um, Kubernetes upgrades in your organizations? The guy says, I drink a lot. You, I, I'm sure we can all appreciate that. Why is it so painful? Um, there, there's a few good reasons for that. And one is just that Kubernetes itself is difficult. There's a lot of components from the control plane, the worker nodes, etcd, the API servers, all the deployments you've got. Um, everything about that is just a lot of moving parts. And we do that in various environments, on-prem, in the cloud, um, how we deployed it is different, the environment stage, whether it's a dev test environment that's constantly being tinkered with, um, you know, the, those different environments add to the complexity issue. And then edge locations as well. You know, they have um, bandwidth and access issues that we need to deal with. And then different cloud providers um, have different rules and different tools to manage Kubernetes. So as an administrator of those systems, I have to know for each of the clouds that I'm running on how to perform those, those operational tasks. 
The frequency is a big thing. So welcome to the cloud native pace. Um, Kubernetes uh, has continuous patch releases, regular minor releases, and we'll cover that later. Um, and then you have your own application release cycles that go along with those. Um, that's something that only you can decide how you want to integrate those with the Kubernetes lifecycle life, life management. Um, but it's definitely a consideration to make sure you're not biting off more than you can chew. And that comes down to resources. Um, you know, getting somebody who, from multiple teams involved that, that have a piece of this upgrade planning and then the final execution, um, it just takes a lot of time and it requires a lot of skill. Um, a lot of organizations don't necessarily budget appropriately for that. They might have a ton of developers, not a ton of platform administrators or operators. So again, that that adds to the pain that we're all feeling. And I think this is a self-portrait for most of us, right? We're wearing our happy, smiley face the first thing in the morning, and then we come in and we think we've got this Kubernetes thing nailed, and then we end up looking like that by the end of the day. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about how Kubernetes is versioned. So Kubernetes follows a pretty typical semantic versioning system. So XYZ 1.28.1. In this case, the one here is the major revision. Um, Kubernetes is still major version one. Uh, the minor release here, .28, um, this is what changes the most frequently. And these are the um, upgrades that cause us the most hassle, right? These, they call it minor changes, but it is changes to the way APIs work, what features are available, um, when new features are added. Those all come in those minor revisions. Um, the, the dot .z there, dot .1 in this case, is the patch version. So those happen continuously. Um, and those are designed to be non-breaking changes. So those are a lot easier to handle automatically. So wrap that all up together, 1.28.1. We give it a fancy code name and a logo. That's Planternetes right now. So the current version of Kubernetes is 1.28.1. Um, um, just out of interest, 1.27 was Chill Vibes um, with a sloth logo. So super, super cool. Not sure I'm into plants. The re release cycles have kind of changed recently or, or in, in the last few years. Um, and I think it's done for the better. Um, I really like what the, the Kubernetes working group is doing here. Um, and the maintainers of Kubernetes have, have really narrowed this down and, and are really putting controls around the release cycle that used to be kind of a little more sketchy. Um, prior to 2021, there were quarterly minor releases. Um, and that frequency was just really, really difficult for not only the maintainers to do the releases, but for us consumers to actually handle those upgrades. Um, they did a survey to see who was on what version of Kubernetes, and they found out that basically everybody was falling behind. So starting with uh, version 1.22, uh, minor upgrades are now released three times a year. So that's every four months, uh, roughly 16 weeks. So three releases a year, typically one beginning of the year, one around KubeCon EU, and then one around KubeCon North America. Um, so there's a process defined for how they include uh, which items in those releases. And there's feature freezes, code freezes, um, a testing period, and then finally that release. And it's all detailed at that URL there, um, and also in the blog post I wrote about this. Um, they publish that release calendar, so you can plan your year. Um, you know, when you're doing your next year's budgets, you can you can put in um, time to perform those upgrades. Now, the managed service providers, the Amazon's, the Google's, Microsoft's, um, they typically release their versions about four to six weeks after the upstream version becomes available. So why should we even bother to upgrade at all? Um, and I kind of ranked these in the order of importance to me. Um, it might be different for your organization, but number one for me is to maintain support. 
So the way um, the upstream Kubernetes works and the, the managed service providers work is they provide support for the current version and the two previous versions. So I, I mentioned the release cycle is every four months. So there's three per year. So that means every Kubernetes version is going to get at minimum 12 months of support. There's also an upgrade window after that to give you um, another couple months to, to get that upgrade done. Um, but that's really critical. Uh, production systems, we don't want to run without support uh, for obvious reasons, right? We've got nobody to call. Um, there aren't new patches added to those, those deprecated versions. Um, if I'm trying to troubleshoot everything, the, anything, the first thing support's going to ask is, are you on the current version? Um, it just it is not a good place to be out of support. Um, the second most important reason, I think, is vulnerability fixes. Um, obviously, there's a lot of security and technology and, and access points into a Kubernetes cluster. So I want to make sure that I have all my CVEs, all those vulnerabilities covered at all times. Compatibility is important. Um, there's a lot of applications that rely on the various APIs that have changed throughout the Kubernetes versioning. Um, so you might see if you're trying to upgrade your monitoring application, for example, um, or even your own end application, if it's relying on a component that's only available in a recent Kubernetes version, um, you have to make sure that it's compatible there. Performance and reliability is always important. We always want more performance and a more reliable system. I put this down in the list um, because I, I, I don't know that I would jump on a new Kubernetes version just to gain you know, a, a really small um, performance improvement. Um, but do understand that you know, out, outside of weird little bugs or anything, um, Kubernetes generally tends to get more performant um, and more reliable as it ages, as newer version comes out. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, is those new features, right? We always want new features and functionality, um, and, and the Kubernetes maintainers do a great job of adding the features that users want. Um, so you, you oftentimes will want to be on the latest Kubernetes version to take advantage of some of those new features. So this, I was talking about posture, right? So how, how are we going to sort of define how we feel about Kubernetes upgrades in general? Um, and this is kind of at an organization layer, right? Um, and for a lot of the newer kind of startup-y, born in the cloud kind of organizations, uh, we might want to be on the latest and greatest, the leading edge, or maybe even the bleeding edge. Right? Um, the, this is, you know, if I have the, the flexibility to be able to do this, um, I can take advantage of those latest features and those performance upgrades. It really is only suitable though, um, if you have enough practices and procedures and processes around that. Um, there's a difference between being nimble and agile um, versus just being a cowboy, right? And, and just running the latest and greatest and upgrading whenever you feel like it without a lot of testing. Um, so I will caution you on this strategy um, on, on whether you want to be on the true bleeding edge. The N minus one version um, or stable releases um, is where I lived in the healthcare environment. Um, mission critical, true mission critical type organizations will often, as a policy, not run the latest and greatest software. They want it out in the field. They want it um, fully tested, fully baked. They want a few patch releases out. Um, this is how I am with my iPhone, right? I, I, I never want to be on the leading edge version of that. Um, I just want to be on a stable version. And then the final way of thinking is the last supported version. Um, I, this is often for companies who are resource constrained, who really don't prioritize um, upgrades. You know, they're, they're happy if it ain't broke, don't fix it uh, kind of methodology. And this can work. I, I will caution you on a few things. 
Um, it's very easy if the organization doesn't have a focus on upgrades to fall behind very, very quickly at, at web scale, at, at cloud native pace. The other thing I've seen these kinds of organizations do is they'll wait until the very end of support, and then they'll upgrade to the latest and greatest. And that introduces a ton of additional risk and complexity. Um, Kubernetes, um, through their version SKU policy, doesn't like you upgrading multiple versions at a time. So in that case where you're going from the last supported to the latest and greatest, you're actually doing all of those intermediate upgrades in between. I believe we put a poll out um, asking if you're running on the latest Kubernetes version. So I would, I would love to see um, what you're doing there so I can get an idea of whether you um, you folks are, are playing in the latest and greatest world or whether you are that more conservative type of organization. Let me touch briefly on, on a few different kinds of clusters and how we address them. Um, On-premises uh, data center and cloud provider infrastructure clusters, uh, you are gonna have to make sure that you upgrade the control plane nodes first and then followed by the worker nodes. It's a fairly simple process, but you have to understand that you are maintaining that entire infrastructure. So you need to make sure that every part of that gets upgraded. For the managed Kubernetes providers, EKSs, AKS, GKE, um, first and foremost, you have to wait for the provider to, to bless that new release and provide support for it. So you're automatically going to be a few weeks behind there. Um, in the case of a managed Kubernetes providers, the provider typically manages the control plane for you. So that, that upgrade will be shielded behind your visibility. Um, you do have to make sure that you are within that version SKU policy so that you can um, make sure that your worker nodes are compatible with that. For edge devices, um, a few things to keep in mind here. So these are re at remote locations. Um, oftentimes, they're small form factor devices. Um, they might be a single node cluster. So they don't have the same high availability of a multi-node cluster. So you have to understand if your application and your workload will be able to support that kind of downtime. Um, in our Edge platform, we have a great way of doing kind of an A-B um, quick turnover of those, those upgrades. So that definitely helps in those kinds of situations. And then bandwidth can often be an issue. Um, a lot of times they might even be disconnected clusters. If you're an oil rig or a cruise ship or, or even a restaurant that's running on you know, a very small amount of data, um, you really have to plan for fetching those new binaries um, and the time it takes to load that over a slow network. And then just access constraints in general. Um, do you have somebody on premise in case some, something goes wrong? Or do you have to roll a truck out to that location? Um, might you have to ship new hardware out there? Can you deal with you know, a day's worth of downtime? Is that acceptable to your business? Let's get into the meat of this presentation, what I'm sure you all came to hear about. Um, a couple of what I consider the best practices for Kubernetes upgrades. And number one is really before you can do anything, you need to know everything about your environment. So you need to take a full inventory, um, do, do a software bill of materials scan. Um, I'll show you how we do that in our tool. Um, understand your environment stages. So make sure you've got dev, test, staging, production environments. Make sure you know which server is which. Um, and then understand who cares about this server. Uh, who are your stakeholders? Is that going to be your end customers? Um, it's also your application developers. It's also your platform folks. It's also your security team. Um, you have to really understand your environment as a whole in order to even start making that plan. The plan is critical and it starts with the calendar. And I mentioned it earlier um, that, that the Kubernetes maintainers have made this a lot easier for us now. So we can plan to have an upgrade event every four weeks. Um, that maintenance window, 
um, if your application's fully redundant and available, might not be an issue. Um, but understand your business when the best time is to do that. A lot of people think Saturday evening, Sunday evening, something like that, when my user volume is low, um, that might be great for your environment, but a financial company might be doing weekend or year-end processing, month-end processing during that time. Um, also, you might not have those resources available right, in that time zone to support a Sunday evening upgrade. Um, I certainly don't want to work Sunday evenings, I can guarantee you that. Um, but you need to communicate with those end users um, and make that as part of your communications plan and your upgrade plan. And then um, important here, have a rollback plan. Um, don't assume that your upgrade is going to walk, work flawlessly. Um, what is your disaster recovery plan? Um, for the Reddit folks, they, they restored from a backup. Um, that's very difficult to do, so make sure you have some documentation on that. I do want to make sure that you fully understand all of the changes that you're going to be implying, applying here. Uh, you need to make sure to carefully review those release notes, uh, make sure that there's nothing deprecated that you rely on, um, check the known issues, that's published as well. Um, check to make sure any of the new features, whether they're actually GA or whether they're more kind of a beta release. Um, do, I, do I want to be relying on stuff that isn't GA? Um, all of those, those release notes, readmes are available. Um, and they're available from all your cloud providers as well. So make sure you peruse all of that during your planning and make sure you understand the full impact of your upgrades. Number four is separating um, application release cycle and your infrastructure upgrades. Uh, and my advice here is just don't overcomplicate this. Um, your life is difficult enough, so separating those two is a good best practice for multiple reasons. Um, you can maintain your application release cycle if, if you're doing automated releases, you know, several times a day or once a week or whatever it is. You can keep doing that but make sure that it is resilient to the application upgrade, the infrastructure upgrade as well. Um, a lot of times these are two different teams that might be working here um, together on this, so make sure that you're communicating there as well. Number five um, should be completely obvious to everybody, but I want to reiterate the importance here. Um, test in dev and test environments. That's what they're there for. Um, do this multiple times, right? Wipe it out, install the right version, do the upgrade, test it again and again. Um, make sure that your application is being tested there. And then treat your staging environment as a mirror of production. So make sure that your clusters are defined exactly the same as they are in production so that you can walk through a full upgrade cycle and make sure that it works so that you're not surprised in, in prod. Um, and then when it comes to rolling it into production, it should really be a non-event, right? It should work exactly how you had it in the staging environment. Another strategy um, I, I see people here is um, doing that upgrade in staging and then changing the roles so that that staging environment becomes the new production environment. So kind of doing a, a hard cutover um, instead of rolling the, the upgrade into production. Um, and that certainly works as well. Um, there's some issues to consider with that that I detail in my blog. And then ensuring application resilience, um, make sure that your application can handle a rolling upgrade. Um, when that happens, the um, Kubernetes will drain all of the pods out of a particular node. Um, make sure your application is going to allow that, that it's not stuck running a job. So test that and verify regularly. Uh, backups, um, th there's a lot of tools for backups. We have, we have some built into our system and then there's some commercial versions as well you can use. Um, make sure that you're running those. Um, even if your recovery plan is going to be to just spin up new clusters, um, you should always be performing a backup and testing those restores. Um, rollback is difficult and it's not something that's practiced very often. So 
more than just making sure your regular backup is running, make sure that you're able to restore from it. And then the final step after an upgrade is doing some proper testing, some post upgrade, maybe some UAT user acceptance testing, um, verify client connectivity, make sure you've got the right number of sessions, the right number of database transactions, make sure the performance is correct, your latencies are correct, all of that instrumentation um, continue to monitor that until you are sure that your environment is set. So a lot of you now are probably saying that still sounds like a lot of work. And it is, um, but hopefully those help. Um, but you're probably asking, where's my easy button? Um, and Pallet can help you with that. So our, our platform for managing Kubernetes is called uh, Spectre Cloud Pallet. Um, and it has a couple of uh, really cool to tools that I'll show you right now. Um, give you a, a brief overview and some slides before we jump into a live demo. Um, the cluster overview provides a nice list of all of the clusters in your environment. And we can drill into those and see the Kubernetes versions of each. We do have a built-in SBOM tool. I'll show you an output of a report for that. So a software bill of materials tool gives you a detailed list of all of the software and versions that are running within your environment. And running those over time helps you track how those change pre and post upgrade. And cluster profiles are um, our, our declarative way of defining all of the infrastructure and applications that are running on a cluster. So all changes are driven by updating a cluster profile. Um, and that's what we'll be using here to do a Kubernetes version. And we'll have the palette agent do that automatic reconciliation and do that upgrade for us. We can also version those cluster profiles um, to help us keep better track of how we make changes. And then I'll show you uh, in my, my staging environment here how once we update a profile, I'll get a notification that updates are available, and I'll just be able to click that and let Pallet take control of that. So let me jump over to my Pallet environment here, and I'll show you what I've got going on. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, because we've got a few minutes here, is just do a really quick upgrade of my staging environment. So this staging environment is running Kubernetes 1.26. So I can drill into the nodes and see they're 1.26.7. Um, and they're driven out of this um, dev, my standard dev profile. So as I was saying, this is the entire stack here. So my Kubernetes layer, I'm just going to drill into here and I'm going to upgrade to version 1.27. It's going to tell me I have some configuration changes in my current version that are going to get overwritten. So I'm going to copy those over to my new version. Um, I had to add some storage roles here to get WordPress to work. Um, and then I'm going to confirm those changes, confirm my updates, and then save that. I can add a note. Upgrading Kate's to 1.27. And this will appear in the audit log. This, it will show me it's in use on my staging cluster. Um, but when I go back to this list of clusters, you see that icon has changed and I've got upgrades available. So when I come into here, you see this updates available button. I'm just going to click that. It's going to show me the version change here, 1.26 to 1.27. I have the option to confirm it, and I'm now going to let Pallet do that upgrade. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I've got my, my hipster shop application running here. Um, I'll leave that running in the background the whole time. Let's buy a vintage camera while we're here. And I'll show you that this rolling upgrade doesn't impact my, my um, application availability. So this is the cluster overview page that I talked about earlier. You can see I've got a couple of EKS clusters and an edge cluster here. My edge cluster, you'll see when I drill into it, it's actually running a really old version of Kubernetes, really old, uh, 1.24 here. And you can see that Pallet's giving me a warning here that some packs are deprecated, so please update them to prevent any errors. And you can see here, this pack 1.24.6 is deprecated. 
So I could upgrade that if I wanted to, um, but for now I'm gonna focus on what is my prod cluster. And actually, let's make sure the stage is running here. Good, okay. So my prod cluster is running at 1.26. All of my nodes are in here at 1.26. My cluster is healthy and running. Um, you can see I've got three nodes here running in US West. This is an EKS cluster. So I just see the worker pools. I, uh, I don't see any of the control plane nodes. Um, this, this is just what I have to manage here. So let's show you the SBOM tool I was talking about. So the software bill of materials is a scan here that I can run. Um, I ran one a couple of days ago um, and an output in this, this format here. Um, we have a couple different formats. Um, but this is going and showing that it scanned all of the applications within my cluster. Um, so you can see that this has multiple, multiple pieces of software running. I think I have WordPress on here. Here it is. Let's drill into WordPress, um, and this will show you all of the components that WordPress installs. So it's a quick, easy Helm chart for me to install, but it's actually all of these components and these versions in here. So you can quickly see how understanding that is going to give you a, a good indicator of everything that's in your environment and whether that upgrade was successful. So the profile for my prod cluster is this my standard dev, uh, my standard prod profile. Um, and by design, I've made it the same as my dev cluster or my dev profile. Um, but theoretically, if I needed different tools on my dev, I could definitely make that a little bit different. Um, if I wanted to have a newer version in dev, but keep this older version in prod, um, that's why I would have two separate profiles here. So let's talk about how we're going to upgrade that. So the various layers here, the OS, Kubernetes network and storage, this blue section is all my infrastructure components. Um, everything above that is kind of an add-on. So it's at a higher level in the stack. So I've got Nginx for ingress, OPA for security, and then my WordPress application and my hipster shop are all system applications that I've installed on top of this stack here. So to make a quick, actually, before I do that, um, instead of doing like I did last time, I'm actually gonna do um, what's a best practice here with versioning my profile. So instead of just keeping on this 1.0, I'm first going to create a new version I'm going to call 2.0, and you see that was created successfully. So now in this dropdown, I have two different versions. So I can see where I was at 1.26 in the old version, and then in the 2.0 version, that's where I'm going to do my upgrade to 1.27. So basically the same thing as I did for my staging cluster. Um, Palette's going to let me know that I've got some changes to my YAML here. So I'm just going to copy this role binding and make sure that that's in. Make sure I've got my tabs correct. And I'm going to confirm those changes. And then I'm going to confirm it and save that change. I am ready to do this in prod. I always like putting annotations in my upgrades. So now you see that I've got different versions here. When I go back to my list of clusters, I don't get that notification that the profile I was using has changed. So I can continue to operate on that old version um, for as long as I choose to. When I go into the profile section that's associated with this cluster, I can then see that I have a couple different versions available to me. So the 1.0 version is on 1.26. And then if I select the 2.0 version, I can see that this is Kubernetes version 1.27. If I had made any other changes to my applications, those would follow along as well. If I wanted to change any of the configurations in addition to what was defined in that profile, I can do that here. So let me save this one. And then up.
graded prod, fingers crossed. I'll tag it so that people know it was me. Okay. So now we can monitor the event log here. So you can see that my nodes are at version 1.26.7. We're going to monitor the event log here, and we'll see that the Spectra Cloud agent has picked up changes to that profile. So it is going to start reconciling those changes. Now, Kubernetes upgrades are all handled through Cluster API, through Cathy. So that's the mechanism we use to handle the back end of the, the Kubernetes upgrade. So you'll see a lot of Cathy related items in this overview. And let's go back to our staging cluster, see how that's doing. We can monitor the nodes and we should see a rolling upgrade happening here. So you see we're initiating the update of the um, staging 01 to version 1.27. It's going to say there's a version mismatch momentarily, but then as the worker nodes are upgraded, um, you'll see this mismatch going away. So let's continue to monitor that. So we've got the upgrade triggered to these working nodes, those worker nodes, um, and we will just be able to see that. Um, one of the nice features we have and the reason we put those um, annotations in is this audit log here will show who actually kicked off each of those um, upgrades. 51. So you can see my, my profile change there um, to my prod environment. This was me upgraded prod, so I put that in there. So really, it, it's a quite a, a simple automated system here. And because the interface is the same across all of those cloud providers um, and my on-prem data centers, I don't need to know the unique tools that are required for each of those systems. Um, I can simply drive everything from those profiles. I'm kind of hoping to be able to show you some events here initiated updates. So depending on how busy the cloud provider is, um, th that's really what takes the majority of the time here. You know, my job as an operator um, is pretty much done as soon as I've, I've hit that upgrade version um, and my profile version has that new version there. Um, of course, I'm gonna want to monitor. So I have um, my workloads here. I can make sure that the, the various pods are running and how much CPU and memory they are containing. Um, I can check the deployments um, and I can drill into these to get a little more information on those. I really want these nodes to update. Um, worker nodes created successfully. So they should be showing up very shortly here. But you can notice that my application is still running here. So um, this will continue to run on those nodes as they're upgraded. Um, it's gonna drain each node success successively. Um, and let's buy a cool little typewriter. I need two of those. So let's add that to my cart. I'm gonna leave that running and let's go back and see if we have any questions. And then we can revisit that in just a second. Let me pull um, this up here. Okay. Let me go to the questions here. Okay, we have just a couple. Um, So the first question is, can't I use just use Kube ADM to upgrade my clusters? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. Um, that's the, not the easy button, basically, right? Um, 
you can use the tools that were used to create your cluster, um, but for each provider, those are going to be different, right? And it's a lot more manual process than being able to drive that from a cluster profile. Um, you also don't have that declarative definition of your cluster. So use, going, allowing a user to go in there and make those changes themselves um, doesn't help you keep your clusters consistent. The next question we have is, can I drive this from Terraform or from my CI tools? Um, yes, so we have a Terraform provider um, that, that has functionality in there for managing cluster profiles. So yes, you can do an update to that um, cluster profile and you can drive that through any of the automation tools that you have. Next question is what happens if I run an unsupported version of Kubernetes? What's the downside? Um, and, and the answer is you don't get support. <laughs> uh, if something goes wrong, uh, you are on your own to fix that. Um, if you have a version of software that you installed or updated that doesn't run on that Kubernetes version, you kind of paint yourself into a corner so you're not able to um, be able to run on that old version. Uh, you also don't get any of the patches associated with those deprecated versions. Um, so that's very critical when we talked about uh, the reason to, to be on a supported version. Somebody asks about downgrading versions, um, and that, that is a very complicated topic. Um, you'll see a lot of the literature just says don't, right? Um, it's one of those, it's theoretically supported, but in the real world, in practice, um, it, it's, it's just really not something that you ever want to do. Um, typically, when you roll back, it's because those nodes have failed. Um, the, the new rolling update has failed. So you don't want to be able, so that you, in order to roll back, you're essentially just stopping that upgrade and going back to the previous version you have. If you did need to redeploy an old cluster, that's why we have the versioning on the profile. So as long as that version is still available, um, which it, it might not be from your cloud provider if it's no longer supported, um, you could spin up a cluster on an older version. Uh, another person asks, how does Google release channels play into this? Um, that, that is a good question. Um, Google release channels kind of go along with that upgrade posture I talked about. Um, they have you enroll your clusters in, uh, I think they call it stable and um, current or something like that, um, where, where they will keep the managed version um, onto one of those versions, whether it's the latest and greatest or whether it's one of those older ones. I just received a notification on my cluster. So let's go ahead and check out what that is doing. There we go. So we can see now that we have um, some new nodes that were just spun up four minutes ago with version 1.27.4. Um, and then my old version is being deleted here. So this one has stopped communicating with me. Um, that's because it's going to be going away. And you can see um, here these new cluster, these new nodes of the cluster are coming in at 1.27.4. Um, and you can see that my application is still running here. Um, let's buy a film camera, a very expensive film camera. So you can see that even though my nodes are, are busy being updated here, um, and this error is in the event logs, you can see that the CAPI provider here has successfully pulled that image and downloaded um, and updated those, cl those cluster nodes. So you can see the status now has changed to deleting the old worker nodes. Um, but the cluster status is busy working. It'll show unhealthy until all of the nodes are cleaned out, um, which only takes a few more minutes. And we should be able to see my prod cluster should eventually go through the same process. Um, 
as I said, depending on the cloud provider, it takes a few minutes to, to kick that off, depending on how busy it is. So hopefully that gave you a good demonstration. Um, let me give you some next steps. Uh, the first is, is really critical. Go, go give me clicks on my blog. Um, I've provided a link there and a nice QR code. You can get your phone out and scan that. Um, I provide uh, a lot more detail into the overview that I gave here. Um, we also have a link there to our doc site um, with a page specifically talking about doing upgrades via a cluster profile. So if you want a little more information on that piece of it, you can um, click through to our doc site there. And then the final link, um, if, if you feel like you need that easy button, um, you're welcome to come try Palette. So sign up for a trial there um, and, and we'll have a quick conversation about what your goals are and then we'll get you access to be able to play with our SaaS environment there. So I thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate your time. I know we're all um, booked up fully with webinars and meetings and everything. So thank you very much.